Well, hello. It's so good to see you. Uh, everyone, this is my friend Lauren. Lauren also studied at Simmons College and is a current scholar of picture books and lover of all things children's literature. She is here to help us learn more about why picture books are so cool. What is one thing you wish everyone knew about picture books? Picture books are so interesting and it's not getting enough attention, I think, um, because people are under the delusion that picture books are only for children. Um, if you ask people what their favorite childhood book is, a lot of people go to picture books. You know, you got your classic. Uh, Good Night Moon, Red Wild and Dog, etc. Um, but you don't have to be a kid to enjoy it all the time. Um, if you've ever read a book out loud, a picture book out loud to eighth graders, highly recommend that experience. It's so much fun. People do not read picture books to kids who are older than like eight. <laughs> and so it's like a special experience. Yeah. Do you have a favorite picture book to read aloud to eighth graders who are also not used to being read picture books anymore? Uh, this is not a picture book, so I'm a little bit cheating. Um, okay. But my favorite read aloud is a board book called Orange Pear Apple Bear by Emily Gravitt. The best. It's just puns and they're so fun. And that's the entire premise of those four words. And they're just like bouncing back and forth and they just get sillier and sillier. And it's like orange bear and you have like an orange sitting on a bear and then you'll see orange bear again later. But like the bear is the color orange. It's been years since I've read it and I think about it all the time. I love it. It's so funny that you bring that one up um, because it's, I don't have a sense of humor. We know this. Um, and it's one of those that I just don't understand. <laughs> I just make you laugh out loud. I, I read it and I get confused every single time. I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> well, you, you know me. I, I dwell in the absurd. Yeah. And, and that, really, that really speaks to me. I think that... Um, something that is like along those lines of being maybe misunderstood or like hit or miss for different people is John Claxton. Mm. Um, our mutual friend Josie does not like him at all or any of his stuff. Um, but I live for it. Um, I think, I also think it's hilarious. Um, I would show a page turn, but it gives away the entire plot of the first book. And it's so rewarding to do it yourself. Um, and I also just have so much respect for the way that John Klassen goes about doing his work and the way he does it. Um, I think that on, on the face of things, he's, I mean, he is without a doubt, like a minimalist. Um, right. It's very clean landscape. Um, yeah. And but it's, it's, it's a lot, it's not a lot of text, but there is emphasis on text. Um, yeah, so here's like. Right, like that is, that's a classic John Classic thing. And I love it because it just gives you this weird, awkward tension. And it's just in all of his books. And I think that that's just him. And I've read so many interviews of how he, has gone about doing his book and the way that he thinks about approaching a picture book. Um, and something that I think is really interesting about John Klassen as a picture book illustrator and author um, is that he used to be in animation. So if you've seen the movie Coraline, which is fantastic, um, he was on the animation team for that movie. And it makes sense to me in the, the ways that he is thinking about how the format of a picture book works. This character in the uh, hat series, the, the, I don't know, the little rodent creature mm -hmm. is one of the things that clued me in that like, I've seen this art before because I looked at that and I was like, it looks like the rats in Coraline, like the, 
you know, the circus rats or the mm-hmm. dancing rats. Um, and they had, you know, more of a distinct tail and stuff, but I was like, oh, that, <laughs> that yeah. is where he's from. Yeah. Yeah, if you have seen the, the Dark by Lemony Snicket, you get the illustrations for that one. And that is like, that's my go-to example of proof that he was on the team for Coraline because they're so visually similar similar in terms of like being interested in light and shadows and like what is this thing hiding? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I just love them. I think it's brilliant. And I think that the eyes in his work, like he doesn't have the, yeah, the, the eyes are the masterpiece. He also does, um, cover illustrations and he'll do like spot illustrations for like middle grade novels. Um, And he posted a picture of one of the covers. I can't remember what it's called now. Yeah. Um, The Bathroom and Skunk and Bathroom? Skunk and Bathroom? I don't know. I think that's what it is. Um, He was talking about how when he originally drew the cover he was thinking about changing the line of sight because they weren't looking at each other. Um, one was taller than the other. And then he yeah. realized that the, the line of sight not matching up was indicative of the feelings that they have for each other because the one who was answering the door was already annoyed with this kid when he showed up. So of course he wasn't gonna look at him. And I was like. That is cool. Um, what is one of the things that he does in the I Want Your Hat Back series that you just really love and that you think people can notice really easily, but that you haven't thought of or that maybe they don't recognize right away? I would say the humor. Um, I don't. Yeah. I think there's. So- How does the humor come across though? Like where you said it's in the eyes. Is it always in the eyes or is it? No, it's sometimes it's just in the, like I, I described him, his, I'd say his overall style, like including the way he writes and the way he illustrates is very awkward. Like it just feels like there's tension and that's where it gets funny is because you're kind of like following along on this weird journey and sometimes weird stuff happens. You don't really know what's happening. Like uh, yeah. in, in the last one and we found a hat like that one is just really, you're like, what's happening? There's these two turtles and it's just like, what are they, what are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, I think that's where it's funny is where you can take um, these really mundane things or really simple sentences. Yeah. And, and it's just it's funny because it seems either out of place with the tone of the rest of the book or um, not like something the character that you've known for the last few pages would do. I think it's like in the first line of I want my hat back because he goes, my hat is gone. I want it back. Okay. And then you turn the page and he goes, have you seen my hat? No, I have not seen your hat. Okay. Thanks anyway. And like just that it's such an awkward little exchange. And you're also just like, it doesn't seem like this bear is really wanting his hat back, but the whole book is about him trying to get his hat back. Oh my God, I'm looking for it. Like, what? Yeah. yeah, I love that. It's just like this very, I feel like John Claxton is really interested in the um, like simplicity. I mean, obviously in his style, um, but that's where so that's where like the complexity comes in. I mean, I could talk forever about just like the gradients in his backgrounds and like, I was going to write an essay at one point about um, the actual art process and the style of illustrating because he's posted a lot about it. And, you know, you could spend three days making a rock and I just love that. It's, yeah. it's clear to me at least that he has a really thorough understanding of how picture books work on all sides, like everything. Um, and you can tell just by the way the different, like the trim sizes of different things. Like, you know, 
the way a story is told because this one is different than all the other ones. Right. And like, of course you can't have this fish going a different way. Like it has to be. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be that way. I also think that maybe it's because of his illustration background, but he's very aware of when a page turn has to be for pacing. So like, mm -hmm. I have to say this thing and then there has to be a second where you can process that thing and move on to the next thing. Right. Um, and it's almost, it reminds me a little bit of a flip book. Yeah, and that's, that's like I was saying, where his animation background is something that really comes to, comes to his advantage. Yeah, who is an illustrator who has like a very different style? Hmm. From, I would say, uh, Julia Sarda with okay. the list. Um, I'm thoroughly happy that your library has it, even if someone has yeah. it currently. We have it. Someone currently has it checked out, so you can get this book, but uh, I'll, Lauren will have to do all the holding up right now because it's not available. Um, <laughs> where John Klassen is a minimalist, I would say that Julia Sarda is a maximalist. Yeah. Uh, because it's like, saturated and there are so many details even just on this page like yeah. every space has is covered and every space has a reason to be covered um, yeah and when it's not it's of note um right i mean it's, it's like molly bang says contrast helps us see um so yeah i think that i mean this this book is the only book that I know of that I that I've encountered by Julia Sardis, which doesn't mean she doesn't have any other. It's just that this is the one that I know and it's the one that I love. Um, I mean, even this cover. Yeah, it's it beautiful. It's gorgeous. It doesn't look like a picture book. If that makes sense, like it doesn't <laughs> look the way that other picture books do, I think because of its, I, I almost want to say gaudiness. Yeah. Um, it feels somewhere between art deco and gothic. It sort of reminds me of how book covers used to be designed in the past with like the gold and then the embellishments on the side, right? Um, and it kind of then draws in from that history piece. And I think it really works for this book because of the setting of this book. Yeah. That's a beautiful page. It's beautiful. Um, and the saturated color palette of the book really sells the world that these characters are in. Um, I think that a lot of picture books are primary colors and mm -hmm. you've got these cheerful tones, which is not a bad thing by any means but different tones suit different books. Um, yeah, like if we compare the, the primary colors in another versus the saturated colors of um, the, li the list, it's very different, but it's also very cool. And I love, she chooses, her pa color palette is still very simple, but it's like mm -hmm. rich and deep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it's very, um, opulent like the home of the the family um even yeah. though their pool is empty um but yeah i i would say i guess they they had more in common than i initially thought um but i still think that they're different in tone mm -hmm. um, and execution um other than that i would say that probably you would be moving into the different, I think a lot of differences in style come in medium, um, which is why I think picture books are partially so exciting. Because um, when you have other books, like a book is a book, it's words on a page, um, but picture books are like, you can be anything. <laughs> yeah, and some books really rely on that interaction between words and text, um, picture books especially, but sometimes you don't need that because um, the pictures are just so clear. Yeah, and I think that um, 
you know, there's always like, there are some picture books who I think very intentionally make that difference between, there's like another story happening between the pictures and the text. Um, and then I think there are some that happen upon it. Um, and I think that's just the, the nature of the form. Um, I mean, there's not, I mean, there's a little bit of, of that playfulness between pictures in the text trilogy. Mm. Um, yeah, I, mean, it I think there's a page in particular where the picture says something different than what the words say, right. and it's funny. Right, that's that's a humor because it doesn't add up. It's like wait, but yeah. Um, but and then I think that like like Julian is a mermaid. Um, I think that maybe sometimes okay. Uh, okay, that happens. <laughs> there are parts where it just stops having text. So that the pictures can take over. Yeah. Um, which is, I think it happens. Like there are pictures on these page or words on these pages, but then mm, just pictures here. Yeah, and like in in that instance, that's um, giving the reader room to decide what this means because it's. One one part of this story has stopped being told, right? And now it's up to you to figure out what these illustrations mean for the story and for this character. Because I mean, you could tell when you showed all of those pictures, there was one color that kept popping up, and so it's like, so what does this color mean in the context of this story? Which is so, I just I also love that that book doesn't have white pages. It has yeah. the pages. Um, wrong pages are so cool. Um, just reminds me of like almost a paper bag or a cardboard feel. Yeah. But also it really brings out the rich tones and allows these people to be people without having to be colored. Yes. And it's so, I mean, that is exciting in and of itself because it just like flips the yeah like so the, the status quo on a text is white right so you have to color them in if you want to differentiate it but not right. a book right and um one of the things i love about julian is a mermaid is that like the story itself holds up on its own like it's it's already a beautiful story but if you know the premise of like if you know about Brooklyn and mm. um, the Mermaid Day Parade, then it just makes it all the more beautiful. As someone who has lived in New York for five years on and off now, um, yeah. that is what makes me love it like deep, deep, deep in my heart is how much of a tribute it is to Brooklyn, the people of Brooklyn and, and that scene in that area. and. The mermaid parade is so cool. I only went once and it was really hot and I thought it was like a fever dream because it was so weird, but it was great. <laughs> For those of us who don't know what the mermaid parade is, can you tell us what it is and why it's so cool? Because like, I remember reading this book and not having that context. Yeah, I was like one of the few people in class that was like, the mermaid parade. Um, so basically it is Brooklyn's celebration of summer. Um, it's, it's sometime in June and it just is a kickoff to parade. It's a summer, it's down on Coney Island, um, on the beach. Uh, well, not on the beach, but like near the beach. Yeah. Um, on the sand. Right, exactly. Um, and I don't know the origins of it entirely, but I know that it is, um, it's a, it's a tribute to all that is to come in the summer and is just like anybody can walk in the parade. Everybody dresses up as a mermaid to whatever extent you find appropriate. Um, and people do different themes. Like I saw twins that were both Frida Kahlo mermaids. And you know, like it's just whatever you want it to be. And it's just so joyful and vibrant because 
I mean, New York is known as a diverse place, but like Brooklyn especially um, has very distinct communities. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's, that's why I say that it's such a great tribute to that area and that tradition and i and and that's what i mean is that like even without knowing about the mermaid parade yeah i didn't know about the mermaid parade but you know just i could stare at that second wordless spread where the fish are sweeping up all day long like for forever you know one day i might have a print of it framed on my wall <laughs> I think about that all the time. Well, mostly, um, our friend Josie's argument for why everybody should care about picture books is that it's affordable art. Um, everyone can own a little bit of art if you have a picture book. Um, yeah. I completely believe in that. <laughs> and not it is affordable art, and illustrators are artists, and many of them do also like sell their artwork professionally. So Julia Love, or Jessica, sorry, Jessica Love is one of those people who she started off selling professionally and, you know, like John Klausen does animation, mm -hmm. but I think also of Kadir Nelson. And Nelson. Like, his portraits are in Congress and they're in all of the Smithsonian and they're often selected for time. And every child can get like their own personal copies of those portraits for less than $20 and they have 17 of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's wild to me the, the way that people do not give enough credit to picture books and as a, as a form and also the illustrators. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. So uh, the past few books that we've held up have all been illustrated and written by the same person. But what about the ones that aren't illustrated and written by the same person? Like we often shelve them, I shelve them in the library by author. But there's this person who has created like half the story, right? Yeah. Um, so which one of these haven't been done by the same creator? I think the only one in this is, list, maybe up, up in the garden, down in the dirt. Is that one not yeah. a different item? Right, because we have, so these, this is how most picture books come anymore. Uh, there's an author and an illustrator. This one, David Robson, Robertson wrote the text, but Julie Flett does the illustrations. Uh -huh. um, Kate Messner, does the text, Christopher Silas Neal does the illustrations. And, you know, like, I cannot picture this book without these illustrations because they are so gorgeous. I also think that if you look at nonfiction picture books, it's way, 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 way more common to have that author illustrator separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I guess is why it's notable that both of these sort of are nonfiction. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I guess that's because like typically the person who is writing the text is an expert in that field um, or mm -hmm. knowledgeable in that area. And then the illustrator is just someone who complements the tone. Yeah. I'm trying to think what the first one in this series between Kate Messner and Christopher Silas Neal was. But you know, Kate is known for her kind of nature, her love of nature and her ability to communicate concepts in nature really clearly. And Christopher Silas Neal just, he does, he captures that spirit so very well. And I think it's really come to these two. Like I think over and under in the snow is one of our favorite ones out here because we get lots of snow. And, you know, you get that underneath world. And then the world on top and what's happening in that. So, yeah. Yeah. I have 
a lot of books about gardening. I really enjoy picture books about gardening. I think it's a very fun niche little area of picture books. But this is one of my favorites um, because of that kind of like the the magic synchronicity of the text and the images and how, I mean, that's one of the great things about having um, two different people working together is when it's done really well, um, you kind of just marvel at how amazingly the thing came together. Yeah. This is one of my favorite spreads because like, here are the ants and they are both up and down. Yeah. And you get to follow them all around the garden. <laughs> I just love, I just love all of this. I mean, even when you have, um, like this is all about them. Yeah. You see a focus on the bugs that are present. Yeah. Or like this one. Mm -hmm. there's a person, but it's so much is so like plant and garden centric and you get the bugs. Yeah. yeah. It's so much fun. And one of the things that I love about nonfiction picture books is the back matter, um, which is unique to nonfiction books. Um, That's that kind of section in the back that like tells you more all about the animals or, um, you know, gives you kind of reference. And this one is good for that one. But I would say also sometimes if it's a historical event, like in when we were alone, it it can be kind of the more serious end of things. Like, yeah, this is what has happened. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, my, um, some of my favorite stuff that's in picture book back matter is when the illustrator or author illustrator talking about the materials that they use. Oh, so, yeah. Um, the one for Dreamers is one of my absolute favorites because she talks about, she has a whole entire list of materials that she used for this book, um, including a chair, a brick from her house, um, traditional Mexican fabrics, leaves and plants from her garden. And so it's like, you get this really real sense. I mean, even when you're flipping through the pages of it, you can tell that it's from her heart. Um, but then you go to the back matter and you see where these things came from. Um, and it's from her. There's, there's all kinds of really cool books that she works into the illustrations as well as that awesome list at the back. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what's that's what's fun to me about back matter is it's so tailored to the content of the book. Um, so, and also it gives you a great um, jumping off point for more resources. I mean, typically nonfiction picture books are what people are referred to, like students, young students are referred to to get a sense of something. Um, and so it'll give you more resources to do further research. Um, and I think that it could be just good for the resources in general if you're interested in whatever topic is the book is about. There is that Jeopardy contestant, right? Who learned all that they learned oh, from, wow. from nonfiction picture books and like reading. And I thought that was so cool because, you know, they contain a lot of information and you learn about a lot of famous people that you really don't have other resources to learn about because they're cool like the person who created this super soaker it's a picture book and it oh, oh my God. adult nonfiction book about it but it, there's a great picture book about it yes i'm like the um oh that one book that we read for nonfiction that was the woman who did the not she wasn't an animator but she did some of the illustrations for disney Remember, oh, like yeah, movie. yeah, that was not that, that's not anything I would pick up on my own. Yeah, full of colors or something like that, yeah. But, but it was so interesting to see just kind of this snapshot of um life, and even um, 
there's someone else that I think of. I mean, there are so many, I think when people think of nonfiction picture books, it's either like biographies or science. Um, and there's a lot of room in between that, but also those are really fun. Like when it's done well, yeah. there are a lot of things you learn about people you didn't know about before. Um, like that one about the, what was it, the nurse gun? Super Soaker. Yeah, the Super Soaker. Or, you know, like, yes, the Little Over Broadway. Like who is thinking, oh, you know what story we need to tell? How the balloons in the Thanksgiving Day Parade even became a thing to begin with. Melissa Sweet, she's the one. <laughs> yeah, and it's a great nonfiction picture book because not only does it tell the story, but it also just like gets you thinking about, wow, this is this crazy tradition that we all just accept and it started somewhere. Yes, and it also has one of the best page turns ever. Which um, one is that? And you have to flip the book. Okay. Let me get to the beginning so you can tell me when to stop. I'm These pen papers also, by the way, are like magic. Yes. Yeah. Um, everything Melissa Sweet does. It's going to take you a minute to get there. So while we're waiting to get there, what do you love about Melissa Sweet? She has so much vitality and personality in the way that she illustrates. Um, I mean, I love her because she is a collagist, a multimedia, like all, she's doing everything all of the time. And um, even though all of her books are, I think visually similar, just because she has such a distinct style, every single, there it is. Yeah, it's just so fun. Like what you like you, that kind of thing belongs in a picture book because of the format. Yeah, because only in a picture book can you be reading along with lies, and then have a whole book rotation or a book turn, as one of our colleagues calls them, where you have to flip the whole thing, and it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's delightful. Um, so she does, I mean, she does a little bit of everything in her book and she dabbles in biographies as well. Um, but she has, in my opinion, I think that there's like a distinct difference between the explicitly biography book versus her other books because she does this thing where she'll have frames, like, yeah, exactly. Like there are literal frames around things it's often pictures of the person. Um, I think she has a book about Webster of Webster's Dictionary. Um, yeah. and, and, and so you can see the friends in there. I mean, I don't think that you could look at the trajectory of picture books and not give Melissa Sweet credit. Um, it's just one of those things. I mean, she is someone who has had a career in picture books for a while now. Um, and is still incredible. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget the day she came to talk and she was like, so what I do is I cut up all of these little, like I cut things out and then I paste them on top of each other and then I take pictures of them to make the illustrations. And so you can see like, she's cut this out and she's drawn this and then it's pasted on top of a, like a book. And then she took a picture of it and that's the illustration here. Um, this one's a really good example where you can actually see the layers. This is a, a for real puppet over here. And this one, like, but she took a picture of it to make it an illustration. You know what that spread reminds me of? The I Spy book. Oh, yeah. Because you can see the dimension. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's what is um, one of the many exciting things about collage as an art form to me is that you can see the layers, you can see, um, I guess, like the human hand, right? Like you can see that it is a creation. Um, mm -hmm. It's less polished and painterly than a traditional watercolor 
or what have you. We have a lot of collage artists to talk about today. Do you want to talk about another one too? Yes. Oh my gosh. Can we talk about wings? Yes. Okay. I adore Christopher Myers. Um, known for his own artwork and also his dad, Walter Dean Myers. Mm -hmm. uh, a big publishing person in young adult, I would say. Um, so I really don't even know if I can fully articulate why I love Christopher Meyer's work so much. Um, but there is just this. I, his art seems so firmly rooted in um, what I would consider, what I know of kind of some of the more traditional Black African art. I think it looks a little yeah, folk art in ways that John Klassen is not folk art, um, mm -hmm. even though he loves that movement. Um, Christopher Myers is, and his work are unapologetically Black. Um, and he does a lot of really good, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but part of the reason why I love Wings specifically um, is the shoes. Um, I think, yeah, the shoes are constantly changing. And I, I I told you at one point I was going, I wanted to write an essay about, I think I did for CIP. Yeah. I don't remember. I think for a project in class. <laughs> um, I wrote about how the shoes in wings give you a clue as to how that character is feeling. Yeah. And um, I mean, Shoes are such an important part of style and self-expression. Um, and I think that, I, in my opinion, <laughs> I think that it could very easily be seen as an extended metaphor um, throughout that book. And, and the way that Christopher Meyer does collage is I would say in line with, um, why can't I think of his name? Ashley. Brian. Brian? Ashley Brian. Yes. Yes. Ashley Brian. Um, his are very clearly like cut. Mm -hmm. out. Um, there's like the shapes and the angles. Um, Christopher Myers does a lot more of those like angles and mm -hmm. Yeah. Those, yeah, you get like sharp edges on his stuff. Um, whereas like Christian Robinson, who also is often doing, another is a really good example of it, um, yeah. is often doing the rounded things. I mean, the world of Christian Robinson is nothing but cheerful. <laughs> yeah, it's all fun, and but it's full of like balls and rounds and... Yeah, like Christian Robinson lives in sunshine and circles. Yeah. I don't think of Christian Robinson as hard edges. Um, I think of him as lightness itself. Um, he just has this very unique worldview um, and on a way of portraying it that is not trite or... Yeah. So like... Another one of my favorites of Christian Robinson is You Matter, which is tackling this really deep subject matter of everyone matters. And sometimes it's hard for us to realize that, um, but it does it in a way that like, it's everyone is playing on the playground the whole time. Literally, those are the illustrations. Mm -hmm. And it never makes it feel like it really is a dark subject. It's just a, both a statement of fact and like a an element of fun in the book is that you matter and that's why you're fun yeah yeah I think it's, it's interesting to me how um I would say like universally likable his work is I mean that's why he's the the new target design right I wish I could buy all of that are you kidding me yes 
so delightful. Uh, but he manages to be so subversive in the way that he does. That. Yeah. So I think like this one's a good one. Just how he changes the direction here. Like you clearly know that it's supposed to be like this, right? Because her hair is up. But you don't even have to turn the page to understand what is happening there. You can just be like, oh, she stuck her head through a world where the ceiling is actually the floor. Right. Yeah. I think of um, his characters. I think that this one is the one that has like, I mean, you have kids of all types. Um, and I know that they're, I mean, even in his target collection, like there are kids of different um, skin colors and there are children in wheelchairs, right? Yeah. It just is, it just is the world, you know? Like it doesn't feel forced. I also really love that this child is clearly drawing on the wall. Well, this child is drawing on the floor and there is a difference. Oh, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like that child is standing and is up in the left corner mm -hmm. and this child is, is squatting down on the right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, here's another good, so like he's one of those that always make sure to include a child in a wheelchair um, or with some other visible uh, needs requirement. And right. there's and always, always, you know, you have. It's never a thing. You know? Yeah, it's never a thing. It just is. It's the world. It's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I just so I think it's 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 hard to be able to acknowledge the truths and and the hard things like you were saying about you matter um and also maintain that cheerful upbeat attitude um but he manages to do it he's another one that really works in the world of minimalism so it's just amazing how he conveys so much with so little. And unlike John Clausen, there's not any like ironic irony or any sense of edges. It's all just play. Yeah. yeah. And he also, I think um, that book is a really great example, again, of like the fun of picture books and how how much of the story is told just through the format. Um, I mean, the characters are on different sides. They're upside down and yeah. you can tell these different things. And that's something that you cannot do in other books. <laughs> right, like. Yeah. And the fact that he uses this, the middle, um, so decisively, like once you cross that middle, the center of gravity flips over. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just one of those, um, one of the joys of picture books is this very specific form. And, and people, children, are really clued into kind of the rules of the form, right? We are taught that books are read left to right, and you hold it in the hand, turn the pages. But then you have a picture book like that one, where- It makes off. just as much sense this way. Because it does this way sometimes. Like this is a bad spread, but this one, yeah. I can literally flop it either way, and it makes just as much sense. Right, and and that's part of the the fun. It's like flipping the form on the head, and then like you have the balloons over Broadway, where you are like, I'm reading a book, I'm reading a book, I'm reading a book, and then it's like, oh, here's a balloon. <laughs> yeah, we can go to the. Stuff of Stars. She's another collage artist at Holmes. I think it is one of those books that manages to do the thing that a lot of, I think when, when people think of children's literature or when they think of picture books, it's a book that exists to teach a child something or it's like a hokey, cutesy, this is a baby shower gift, um, you know? I mean, I, I Love You This Much is a book that is very sweet and very heartfelt. Um, 
But I think that the stuff of stars is something that is doing more because I, <laughs> of course, I like it because I think it's a little bit existential. Um, it's very much concerned with what makes a human and how are we ourselves. Um, and it's penned as not necessarily a letter, but like a story to a child uh, mm -hmm. about how they came into existence on this planet um, and how we all come into existence. Yeah. And this is maybe, so we were talking about how Christian Robinson takes a really deep subject, powerful subject and makes it light and fun. And like, she starts, the first line is, in the dark and she's not afraid to be like this is a dark section but it, it is dark and you can feel that dark you know mm -hmm. um and it's just a very different style because she gets at her deepness with by by allowing you to be like whoa i feel that like the biggest word on this page is bang and i can feel that from looking at the page. Well, and just that single page turn of like, I'm interesting, I'm I'm introducing you to the dark. This is where we begin. And you're like, okay. Dark, dark, yeah. dark. And then you turn and it's like, and wow. It's and then like. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's very, um, in, I think it's very impressive. I think that there are a lot of, really cool people doing really cool things in the picture book space. Like I said at the beginning, I think it is one of the most interesting yeah. places to be in the publishing world or to pay attention to. While we're talking about introducing dark subject matter, we have to bring in this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and how it's so, it's so it's so wonderful and soft, but also is really effective. Yeah, I think that um, Julie Flett, who is the illustrator of that book and many others, does a really good job of holding the weight of the subject matter of most of the book that she's illustrating and um it's not one of those things where we're trying to make something bad and coat it in sugar and make it okay um because talking about the experiences of first nations people um at boarding schools that's what that one specifically is about um or residence schools yeah, yeah residence schools residential um that is not something Sure. And Julie Flett is an illustrator who's doing a really great job with that. There are some other non-picture book publications and publishers that are doing really great work. But Julie Flett does a, she does honor to those people and those topics by um, the simplicity of the way that she does things. Yeah. And I think one of the things that really strikes me about this book is she introduces it in such a way that you're in a familiar sort of peaceful setting. And because it is something that's really hard to, to talk about to a child, like the history is not always good and that sometimes personal history can be especially bad. And so she sets, up, sets us up with like, here you are in this beautiful intimate setting with doing something with someone you love and care about. And they're kindly explaining to you some, some of the things that are hard to explain about. And you also get some breaks from that. Like, right. we were still resilient and if we are still here and we made it, and we're gonna be okay, but here is also some things that you need to know, you know, and having that contrast between 
the really hard images and then these like beautiful helpful images is important sometimes yeah and i think you're right about um the setup of the book where it's like very welcoming because we are as the audience we are kind of brought along um, so carson ellis and john classen to me are kind of like buddies like they're illustration buddies um i don't know if it's because i'm obsessed with both of them um, and that they're actually friends in real life. <laughs> um, but Carson Ellis goes about things in a different way. Um, she doesn't have the irony or the necessarily minimalist. I wouldn't call Carson Ellis a minimalist. I think that she's really, really rooted in um, the, the style that she's interested in. So she is interested in folk art and um, kind of like the Russian type of thing. If you look at the, there's a spread in there um, that has like, that one's my favorite for obvious reasons. Um, yeah. She has a very specific style and um, it delights me. I love it. She is, I would say, primarily concerned or interested in um, with nature, um, which is why that double spread of the city and an yeah. apartment delights me so much. Um, yeah, this is so like, it manages to be Carson Ellis while also being not what she normally does. I have the only book I own of hers is The Shortest Day, oh. and this is very much yeah her style. Like this guy. Yeah, I'm thinking like even the opening spread of this book is the one with the bird and the tree, right? Like. Yeah, like it feels very, I, I think of like textiles, like American quilting. And mm -hmm. I think that he is interested in like Eastern European. That, I think that's where I was going with the Russian thing was like Eastern yeah. European style. Well, um, and I can kind of see it like, you know, she has those elements. Yeah, really shine. Yeah, and she does a lot of like Viking y, lumberjack looking people. Yeah, I mean, um, this one, this person. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, this is a really great example of her style and her, I would say, like her roots. Um, the illustrations that she does for the Wildwood series, um, which is a middle grade series, those illustrations are. A really great example because I mean they're just plates um, throughout the book, um, but it's very much that same thing. Um, I don't know how else I would describe her work, but it feels very warm and cozy to me. Yeah, I would say like even in sort of her more desolate spreads, mm -hmm. like this one, there's just this kind of central sense of invitation. Yeah. You know, um, or like, I still wanna be here, even though it doesn't necessarily look like a place I would usually pick for myself. Right. It, it, I think it's the way that she illustrates. Um, she is so interested in details and, again, color palette, um, I would say. She talked about deciding on that first spread that I showed with that guy and trying to pick the, the color palette for it um, to convey, because the color is conveying so much 
of the story, especially for this one, which is about the the sun and 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 how the equinox. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, and it's going away. And it's yeah, really, but sure. What? The solstice, I think, because it's yeah. the shortest day. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that that's one of the things that's amazing. And and that's what I think is so great about having such different styles of art um, and so many different illustrators doing so many different things um, because you get to see, all you have to do is look at books by different people and see how different materials and styles tell different stories. I think it's pretty cool that like, these exist in the same place in my library, mm -hmm. right? But even just looking at their cover, these are so very different books. Yeah. And then just to cover our last person, but he is rooted in an art style that pays homage to his heritage. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that he does books about also are along those lines. Um, and I think that it's incredible to see people doing that kind of work and keeping a specific type of art style alive. Um, He's also another great example of collage because he uses like real materials and then photoshops them in. So like his hair, if you look at the hair on his people, it's real hair. That's real hair that he's yeah. like photoshopped into this, um, this new world. And so he does digital, lots of digital work. This one, this dress, you can really see, you know, that it's, fabric mm -hmm. but it's here and it gives it so much life and personality which I think is so fun because the figures that he has are 2D they're like yeah it's like, this thing. like they are so flat and yet there's so much movement right or these guys right right they're flat but you can tell exactly kind of how they're moving because of how they're pointed. Exactly. And it's not, um, one of the words that I use to describe the way that John Klassen writes is like stilted sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that is not how Duncan Tonesia illustrates. No. There's so, there's so much thought put into each and every decision of like positioning. And then, like you're saying, the things that he's photoshopping in give this artwork like a completely different layer of meaning and life. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And then the shadow. Yeah. It's just, it's so, I think it's so exciting how many different ways there are to tell a story. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is, after I finish reading a picture book is think about how it would be different if someone else had illustrated it um, or, you know, something along those lines. Um, if, you, if you read enough picture books and if you look at enough picture books, then it, it's hard to, I don't, I don't know, like everyone has their it, own perspective. I think of, if we go back to another and then John Classen, how would another be different if John Glossin was illustrating this portal fantasy, right? Yeah. Well, there would definitely be a human who looked a little bit different because John Glossin's humans are very distinctive in their features. Um, but also like probably a much darker color palette, maybe some yellows, some, you know, but also it would be like more, it would almost be Fun, it would be funny, but it wouldn't, it would be more on the edge of like danger. Whereas this, this, I have never felt threatened reading this book, you know, but I could feel threatened, even just a little bit, slightly threatened. Because paranoia that runs yeah. through 
Yeah, John Klassen writes about that in an interview. Like the, I think he says it for the fifth one. Um, this is not my hat. He talks about how one of his inspirations is Alfred Hitchcock. Oh yeah. Okay. Like, cool. Like it would, it would be a totally, and then if you think about this series, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if it was a Melissa Sweet series. <laughs> so, she fell down already, sorry. She's here. You know, it'd be totally different. Yeah. Like if Melissa was doing a story about it not being a hat, there would be a collage hat on every single page. Right. You know? Yeah. I don't know. I think that's a fun thing to think about is like, how would this book be different if, um, Someone else did it. Um, I think that the, I don't know, maybe it's just because we took that class where we had to paginate a picture book. Um, yeah. And it shows you, like when you have to sit down and look at just the text and sit down with your little boxes and figure out how the story is going to unfold, it really makes you realize how different every single picture book you lay your hands on could have been yeah yeah also no go ahead no i was just thinking of like different editions of different books like frederick by leo leone has been published i don't know how many times right and the one i distinctly remember as a kid did not have a page break in between them being like frederick what about your work and then him being like, my work collecting colors. And so it always felt like just so natural to me. But the ones that we have in the library, it's, and Frederick, what about your work? Turn the page. And he starts describing his colors. Hmm. And it's like such a different thing in the storytelling. It's a totally different experience. It makes me think of um, the, the Polar Express guy. Yeah. Chris Van Ellsberg. Chris Van Ellsberg. He, I mean, <laughs> that's a, so I guess this kind of goes to my point about that I was going to make about picture books is um, one of the things that I love about them are the production aspect and how many different ways you can have a picture book in front of you. Like another are glossy pages. Um, right. Like the lists are mapped. Um, and then, you know, you have different types of things. And so the paper is playing a different role, whereas Julian as a mermaid has a different role because of that brown paper. Right, like comparing these two right. pages or setups, and even just the trim size. Yes, and, and the trim size. I mean, if you have, like when you have a book like this. Yeah, or like wings. One of the things we didn't talk about that I love about wings is the perspective of wings and like how it's very clearly above something. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of the story. Like you have to have this length to make that a part of the story. Whereas this is very clearly like an internal story. Yeah. Same with when we were alone, because it's about really like understanding yourself or the, the way the world works. And you have to do that in your head as opposed that's to being above, you know? Yeah, that's, that's what I love is that like every single part of a picture book is, is telling the story. And um, whether that means that your author or your illustrator is coming back to you because the color, right, is, uh, which was Chris Van Alford's issues, issue. um, or, you know, like the Mm. It's a Kwame Alexander picture book. Oh, Undefeated. Undefeated. Yeah. So that's the art director for that book. Talked about how many times you have to go back to the printer to adjust the skin tones on people because there were so many different skin tones. Um, that was a Kadir Nelson. Yeah. Yeah. So like... <laughs> Again, there's that thing where Kadir Nelson is doing like oil painting, which is not a traditional picture book medium. <laughs> They're huge. They're not like... They're massive. 
designed for the picture book size, right? And so not only when they go to print them, do they have to scale them down properly, but they also have to take into effect all the ways that the oil changes as it's being digitally reproduced. And right. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's like, uh, I'm forever and always a production nerd. Um, mm -hmm. That's like one of my favorite things about all books. Um, but there's so much to love in production for picture books. Um, when you have a gatefold, I didn't give you any. Yeah, no, we don't have any. I don't think I gave you any that have a gatefold, but when you pull out the other page, or then you go to Like a book that has a long page in the middle or mm -hmm. like giant squid, where you have to open it up to see the full giant squid. Yes, or like um, Blue or Green by Laura Vaccaro Seeger. Yeah. Where um, you have to lift little die cuts to figure out what it is. Like that's just so. I don't know how you can't be excited about that kind of thing. I mean, there's so much to love about picture books, and there's so much joy that I think it's it's silly to me to rob yourself of that kind of joy and fun just because you're not like a kid anymore or whatever. Yeah. I also think that when we relegate picture books to the realm of childhood and people who are reading with children, we're forgetting how much is actually happening in our brains when we're reading or when we're looking at pictures. Like it takes a lot to comprehend some of these pictures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, like Carson Ellis is not a, an illustrator where you can just glance at it and know what's happening in one glance. You really have to look at them. And that's without the words. <laughs> right. And even with minimalistic illustrators like John Klassen or Christian Robinson, that essentially like you should be able to look at in one dose and say, I know what's going on. The cool thing is, is that like, even if we're just looking at this character, there's so much facial expression and story that happens in this. So even though I can go, oh, yep, girl and her cat, that's what's happening in this picture. I can look at it and be like, the girl is happy to see her cat. The cat is actually happy to see her. You know, I can't, I'm not looking at it and going, did she find that cat? Is it, you, you know, like I have no questions. Something yeah. Like the cat is leaning towards the next page, but she's not looking at what's up above her. She's looking at the cat. Right. Yeah. And so like, you have to interpret all of that. And then also the story and just the wonder of the, how the story works is there. And being able to follow along both visually and auditorially is so huge and so cool. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I guess that's kind of just like boils down to all of the points that we're making about picture books is like, they are entirely more complex than anybody, than, than most people are giving them credit for. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yeah.